This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 664, recorded on September 16th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's sunny and clear, 72 Fahrenheit, 22 Celsius. Wow. It's warmer there than here. It's 19 here. I put a jacket on this morning. It was yeah, chilly. it's still cold in my house. I'm wearing a sweater. <laughs> also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Yeah, it's uh, much colder here. It's 60 Fahrenheit, 15 Celsius. Um, and uh, our skies are, are pretty gray, uh, I think, with some uh, some of the smoke. Really? You see smoke? I, I have not really been able to see the sky clearly uh, since sun, uh, Monday. There's kind of a glow of sun, but it is, uh, yeah, there are no clouds, but it's, it is gray, yeah. But it could just yeah. be early morning. And from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, Vincent. There's your smile. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, so what do we got here? We got um, 82 degrees, which for us is balmy. All right. And we're headed for 88. Chance of thunderstorms, though right now it's clear skies. And as I look down at the two-week forecast, the last week of which, of course, is fake news, but nevertheless, uh, <laughs> is um, uh, I don't see 90. I see mm. mid to upper 80s, which is uh, fine with me. I, I remember my visit to, to Austin. I loved it. It was so hot. It was great. I really. <laughs> and Galveston, well, it, boy, it was even yeah. hotter and more humid there. Uh, that was amazing. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Yep. Plenty hot. We get plenty of that. And And Sometimes it freezes there, right? Indeed. Yes, we get, mm, I wouldn't say extreme extremes, but, you know, with less humidity, we do get uh, greater extremes of temperature than we uh, got in Florida. So, yeah, oh, we can count on numerous days of freezing. Uh, Amy showed me a picture from her cousin in um, Portland where the deck looks like it's covered in snow and it's ash. Ooh. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. What's going on out there? It's bad. If you like what we do here on TWIV, consider supporting us. Uh, you know, there are other podcasts as uh, part of this Microbe TV family. You can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. Different ways uh, you can support us. PayPal, Patreon, uh, Amazon affiliate links, although nobody uses that. But cafepress.com slash TWIV. Lots of people have been buying swag and... Um, I added a few things on request. Some people wanted buttons and stickers. And I actually, last night I decided to categorize them because it was too disorganized. So they put them in folders. So you have clothing, um, drinkware. What else is there? Office stuff that's like stickers and buttons and mouse pads and then face masks. Okay. That's my, cool. o that's my OCD Showing up on Cafe nice. Press. I don't know. I don't know how you have time for. Well, stuff I like had that. an hour course, where you're doing that. I'm reading the comics. I wanted right? to do. I wanted to chill for an hour. So that's uh, chilling for you. I did that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun to, uh, yeah. and I put a few news. And I have some ideas. And I was just going to add some more. The face mask, you know, right now comes in Twiv. I want to add the face masks are cool thing onto it. That would be neat, and yeah. also the mm -hmm. miasma. And the guy who did the Miasma t-shirt, I, I asked him, someone wants a t-shirt that says, keep your politics out of our science. So I asked them to make one of those because I think that would be cool. <laughs> um, but I think, um, you know, people have purchased over a thousand items since January. It's great. Shirts, Thanks. mugs, cool. et cetera. And I'm guessing when we can travel again, I'll start to see some people somewhere <laughs> wearing <laughs> these things. All right. And um, Kathy, can we still chat with a virologist? Yes, you can. And as we discovered, uh, Rich discovered recently, it's in the rotating images. So when you see the images, uh, scroll down a little bit, hit the forward or back arrows, 
um, till you see the chat with a virologist. We did have it as a permanent link below that and it went away. So we're <laughs> working on it. So anyway, it's at asv.org and that will give you a curated list of virologists that you can then invite to come talk to your book club, your homeschool, your school, etc. How about knitting club? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I have been surprised by the um, types of requests I have gotten. Um, I have a group of lawyers um, and a um, a kids club um, and an English class. Yep. Nice. So good. I just got a request from somebody in Buda that looks like it's via chat with a virologist. And this person is... um, Background in music education and information studies. This is via the Buda Public Library. Cool. Works for me. Yeah. Going the other way, on Instagram, I follow this ballerina, and she wrote today, if anybody wants a performance, please, I'd love to. I can imagine putting her in a room with a camera and live streaming it. Wouldn't that be cool? Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be cool. You you guys want to chat with a virologist. I'd love to watch. Watch that. She said, I'm starving for actually, performance. <laughs> actually, Harper would love that. Harper's into ballet? Harper's uh, Harper's on point, dude. On point. Nice. Okay. Very cool. Good. So she'll be here in New York City one day. Huh? You got it. All right. I've had multiple ballet dancers in my, my virology class, by the way. Um, one year, I mean, a couple of students who are studying – And then one year I had a dancer who actually was a dancer with the New York City Ballet. And uh, she was great. She she did really well in the course. She wanted to apply to medical school because she said, you know, we can't dance forever. (laughs) We we break physically. And so she ended up getting into medical school. Uh, I think uh, she's going to NYU. uh, And um, it was just amazing. I have a picture of her on my Instagram. But, you know, she said ballet dancers like to know how how their bodies work and viruses are part of that. So that's why they're interested. And over the years, I've had quite a few. It's cool. All right. Um, Last thing, a a lot of you have questions about viruses and basic stuff. You should take my virology course, virology.blog slash course. Um, It's uh, all the videos are there on YouTube, 26 or 25 of them. It's from the spring course. And um, as you'll see, we have an email from someone who says it takes him eight hours to get through each lecture. That's I'm sorry it takes so long, but uh, you could learn a lot. A lot of your questions. That means would he's be actually answered. learning. Yeah. yeah. So check it out. It's free, and there'll be another one in the spring. All right, we Where's have the s- new textbook. Oh, the textbook is is uh, out now. Actually, I thank you for reminded reminding me um the the pdf is available um and you can order the copy and i will put a link to that link you know periodically my browser just freezes come on um here we go link to textbook uh and you know the cool thing for you listeners is that i get 10 author copies for free and i don't need 10 copies uh, so I will give eight of them away. We'll have some kind of contest. I think that's how we did our haiku or verse contest last time, right? I think yeah. so. I think that we used to give things away, and once we had a, an essay that was too long, <laughs> we decided to try verse. <laughs> it's like which, <laughs> papers. <laughs> yeah, it's too long, but verse works really well, and that's how we got in touch with Jolene. She she wrote a winning verse. So anyway, we will give away ten, eight, eight copies. Um, so it is. Unfortunately, $180 for two volumes. So if you want to wait, check it out. Okay, now we have a couple of things here today to talk about. Uh, the first is a um, an article over at Nature by Ewan Calloway. Would you say Ewan or Ewan? How do you say E-W-E-N? I would say Ewan. Ewan, mm-hmm. who I want to commend. Ewan, you did a great job at making a balanced view of this this is the title is the coronavirus is mutating does it matter different SARS-CoV-2 strains 
Now, there you go. There's no strains yet. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to uh, ask you to refresh the vocabulary there. <laughs> Different SARS-CoV-2 isolates haven't yet had a major impact on the course of the pandemic, but they might in the future. And that's absolutely true. And this is a discussion of... Um, all the different changes. So remember, the genome of SARS-CoV-2 is about 29,900 bases in length. And there have been 90,000 isolates sequenced and made public so far at GISAID.org. And I think they have cataloged 12,000 mutations among those. And a mutation is a change in the nucleotide sequence. It's not a change in the amino acid sequence. I think my colleagues here would agree with me uh, that yep. yes. mutation mm -hmm. was originally defined as a change. But of course, even in this paper, they talk about the D614G mutation. It's an amino acid change. So, so for the uh, newbies out there who are not versed in molecular biology, uh, the amino acid sequence of the protein is what really counts. And because of the way the genetic code works, there are, you know, uh, roughly a third of mutations that have no impact whatsoever. They don't change the amino acid sequence. And there's another significant fraction uh, that may change the amino acid sequence, but to an amino acid that uh, that really doesn't doesn't change the properties uh, of the protein. And there could even be amino acid changes that are pretty significant, but nevertheless don't change the properties of the protein or the virus. So it's, um, you know, just even in theory, a minor fraction of mutations that are gonna be of uh, any consequence whatsoever. And, you know, well, these are showing up, so they aren't lethal, okay. And I think any, if you take any two isolates of SARS-CoV-2, they differ by about 10 mutations. Um, and so... And, and let's do the vocabulary. Uh, in, in our realm, mm -hmm. a strain is something that actually has different properties, right? Yeah, that's what I would say. And so you would call these variants or isolates? Isolates. Or variants, isolates. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not strains. Which is a nice neutral term that doesn't imply that it's actually doing anything different. Yeah. Right. And the, the point here is that, um, you know, the question is, does it matter if the coronavirus is mutating? Um, since we don't know if it matters, we can't say that they are strains with new properties. Right. right. I mean, in every new outbreak at the beginning, some article will journal, journal, a newspaper article will say the virus is mutating, which just burns me up because, of course, it's mutating. RNA viruses are always mutating. Even DNA viruses mutate. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter because when a virus enters you, it mutates like crazy as it's re reproducing in you, especially RNA viruses, which make a lot of mistakes and they can't be corrected except for the coronaviruses, which have an error correcting protein. And so they, they undergo less mutation. But so as a, if a virus enters a new person, many mutations will be sustained. Uh, many of them are lethal. They knock out virus reproduction. Many of them make it less fit so that it will not transmit efficiency to another person. Many of them are neutral and are passed along. And we call that a founder effect. So if it ar mutation arises in one person and they propagate, they're just there because they're not having a negative effect. Now, there can be mutations that have a positive impact on some property, but we haven't seen any of those yet and that's what this article is about and they focus on this single amino acid change in the spike that arose uh, back in you know, january february and since now it's uh, as of now and there's a nice graph of this the frequency it's in every isolate globally and many authors have uh, claimed that this is because it increases transmission in fact uh, there was a, a preprint a few months ago on this, which we discussed. And in the title, they had an alarming spread. This mutation causes an alarming spread. And they talk about that. And they say, yeah, we shouldn't have said it was alarming. <laughs> we took it out of the title when it was published. Because it has minor effects in cell culture, but there's no evidence that it has any effect in people. And so if you want to claim that a change like D614G has an effect in people, you have to provide evidence biological evidence that uh, certainly is not changing pathogenicity. 
Uh, and, you know, a lot of people think it's improving transmission because it's spreading, but there's no evidence for that. And I think many people in this article agree. I think Tim Sheehan said it might make a difference. It might not. I thought that preprint was incredibly premature. Sheehan is uh, a, a part of Ralph Barrick's lab, I believe. Uh, is that, I, hope, I hope I got that right. Mm -hmm. UNC. Mm -hmm. UNC. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so go ahead, Kathy. Well, I was going to say they do mention two things. One is a September 2nd preprint, and one is another thing from uh, Andrew Rambeau. And mm -hmm. he has that uh, site it's called something. Virological, by, right? Virological. And so maybe it's on that site. I didn't have time to look at those that are starting to hint that uh, they're looking at uh, viruses with a mutation in uh, – a human lung cell line and airway tissues. Uh, that's the uh, preprint from somewhere. I didn't, as I said, I didn't look it up, but you can check it out in this article. And then uh, the one from uh, Rambo, Volts, and Connor is based on uh, 25,000 viral samples. Um, no clinical differences in people infected with either virus, but the G viruses tended to transmit slightly faster than lineages that didn't carry the change and formed larger clusters of infections. So, uh, but this paper isn't citing that as being even a preprint yet, but again, maybe it's on virological. Yeah. And the end of that paragraph, I think is really interesting. It says the estimates of the difference in transmission hover around 20%. Um, Volt says, but the true value could be higher or lower. Um, there's not a large effect in absolute terms, says Rambo. So um, yeah. it's um, not coming out to be anything really consequential. So a proponent of this is Jeremy Luban, who I've had offline conversations about this. He says, all of us agree that DDG is making the particles more infectious, but this is in cell culture. Uh, and Nathan Grubau says, what's irritating are people taking their results in very controlled settings, that means in cell culture in the laboratory, and saying this means something for the pandemic that we are so far from knowing. We are so far away from knowing. Uh, so I, I thought it was balanced because he spoke to people on multiple sides and got their opinions. And, you know, in the end, um, it's not clear, but we should keep an eye on it. Sure, I think that's fine. But, you know, the we said here on Twitter that original preprint saying it's alarming was just out of control. It was just, there's no reason to say it's alarming. The, uh, uh, the article is nice too, because uh, he gets all the science right. And it's got it does, nice yeah. diagrams of the uh, what the mutation means and what the amino acid changes are and the spike protein and where it is and all that kind of stuff uh, and the mutation rate in the virus and everything else. So it's a really nice summary of of this whole thing. Yeah. And um, I, so, Ewan, I thank you for a balanced <clears throat> view. I wish everything in nature were as balanced, but, um, you know. We take it one step at a time. Anyway, this is open access. You can Everyone can see this as well. So you can read it. It was published September 8th. Very nice. All right. Then, then um, a paper published in um, Nature Medicine, a brief communication, which I think is really important. Um, and it's not about SARS-CoV-2, but it is about seasonal coronaviruses. Uh, it's called Seasonal Coronavirus Protective Immunity is Short-Lasting. And this is a group out of uh, University of Amsterdam, um, University of Antwerp, uh, an institution in Madrid. Um, and the first, the authors are Edridge, Kazaraska, Host, Baker, Klein, Loans, Jebink, Matzer, Kinsella, Rueda, Levin, Goosens, Prince, Sastre, Dej, and Vanderhoek. Um, so this is cool because the, it's addressing the duration of or the durability of immunity um, to these seasonal coronaviruses, of which there are four. And I just want to say at the outset, what does this mean, protective immunity? What are they talking about in the title? Protect. They never actually define whether they're talking about protective immunity for infection or disease. It turns out it's for disease because uh, these individuals uh, are infected over and over again, as you'll see. So the question is, how long is um, 
immunity lasts for seasonal coronaviruses. And there, there are a number of reasons why this hasn't been done um, before. Um, these infections are typically asymptomatic, so you'd have to just screen lots and lots of people, right, to get ones who are infected, and you'd have to sample them continuously. So they say PCR isn't a great solution to asking this, answering this question. Um, but you could use serological assays because it's already known that antibodies remain elevated for about a year after infection. Other studies have already shown that. So what they did, they took serum samples from the Amsterdam cohort studies on HIV-1 infection and AIDS. So this has been following people, a cohort, the same people who are AIDS, who have AIDS since the 1980s right, to see how their infections are going. And so they have serum stored away uh, from these individuals. So, so you can take that and use it and repurpose it, right, for something else. So they picked 10 healthy uh, individuals from this cohort. They didn't have any illnesses that might interfere in some way. And they had uh, blood stored f uh, that had been collected every three months between uh, before 1989 and then every six months afterwards. You know, great, a great resource, right? And this is, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just use what's there. And so then they designed a um, ELISA assay for a, a region of the nucleocapsid protein for each of the four seasonal coronaviruses, NL63, 229E, OC43, and HKU1. And more, another series of names that roll right off the tongue, right? Not as nice as SARS-CoV-2, I think, but that's what they are. They, two of those were first discovered in the 60s, the first human coronaviruses discovered. And then the second two were discovered after SARS when people started looking harder for uh, other human coronaviruses. So then we have four. I just focused in on the bottom here to, that they have a measles virus control, which mm -hmm. is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I like that as a control. Right. So then they can say, okay, what uh, over these samples, which are every three months, how often do we see spikes in antibody, rises in antibody? Or what are, what are the kinetics of antibody? Does it go up? Does it go down? What, is, what happens? And they can see reinfection, which is a um, reinfection, the antibody titers go up. And they have one individual in, in one of these figures, uh, and they show the data for each of the four seasonal coronas and measles virus, as you can see, which stays steady, <laughs> right? And then the coronaviruses, the antibodies go down and then they go up and then they go down and then they go up. And basically reinfection times uh, as little as every six months, 12 months or longer. So I wanna, I wanna be uh, clear here. Uh, the only actual measurements here are antibodies That's right. to these viruses, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And there's no reporting of disease or anything else. No. Right? That's correct. That's and right. so the, the spike in antibody for any particular virus implies that they've been infected, but there's no yeah, assay right. for virus or anything. There's no thing about uh, disease. I think it's a perfectly valid interpretation that they've been uh, uh, reinfected. But yeah. Those yeah. are the data, just the antibodies. That's right, because yeah, these exactly. are blood samples, right? So there's no way you're going to do PCR and find these viruses in the blood. These are upper right. tract infections. So, right. Yes. I think that's a reasonable and, and, assumption, right, Brianne? That oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a reasonable assumption. Um, I think that, you know, maybe there could have been um, really uh, slight infections um, with a low amount of virus that wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, bump the antibodies up. Yeah, so I would right. say that maybe this is, if anything, a slight underestimate yeah, yeah. of sure. infection. Um, but I think that this is a reasonable um, way to answer this question, which would be really hard to answer in any other way. And I think the measles virus control is great because that's just a flat line. Yep. And you can yep. see how these uh, vary relative to that. And it gives you, you know, it's not like your immune system is got this sort of chatter going on all the time. If you look at another uh, pathogen that you know doesn't reinfect, you get a flat line. Now, the measles is flat because these people were not infected with measles. 
virus, right? They're uh, all right. probably vaccinated, right? Right. And mm-hmm. so I, I don't know the answer to this, whether measles vaccine is sterilizing or not, if you, but I would assume you would see a, a bump in antibody if you got infected and the, and the vaccine immunity kicked in, right? They yeah. don't see that. So, the, you know, measles is relatively rare, even though there are cases, and especially in the Netherlands, there are cases because they have a cohort of anti-vaxxers who do not immunize their kids and they get measles, but they're mostly kids and, and these are adults, so. Right, those were in the Michael Minna study that was on immune. That's right, <laughs> that's right. Last November. That's they, right. they also mentioned that they specifically use patients who hadn't had a disease yeah. um, that would exclude them. And so you would imagine that people who were reinfected with measles in this HIV cohort would have been symptomatic. There are subtleties to these data, too, that are that interest me in particular. I mean, we could talk about several, but in particular, and I think they comment on this, uh, this one patient in, um, for those who might be, well, we don't have this shared, but that's okay. There's this one patient infected with, uh, or where they're assaying for HKU1, mm-hmm. who in about 2007 shows a spike in it stays up yeah it does okay weird it's weird yeah so i had a little trouble with figure 1b i'm I'm sorry to call out a figure because i know people are listening but the title of this is the interval between reinfections determined for the 10 individuals and this is a graph where on the y-axis they have uh, the each of the individual viruses and then a total and on the x-axis time between infections and you see dots of different colors, orange, white, red, blue, and green, and purple. But that doesn't add up to 10. So did they just add all the the 10 individuals together for each virus, you think? So this is sort of any time there was a reinfection um, in any individual. So we're not stratifying by individual. It's just by virus here. Right. Mm -hmm. Because the... you know, all they say is white dots are reinfections without a decrease in antibody, black vertical lines, median. But then what's orange, red, and blue, and green, and purple? Just the different viruses, I guess, but they should say that. That's what it looks like to me, yeah. Same color scheme as in A. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, you can see from that one that you get reinfections roughly every six months, right? Every six months, one year, you get reinfection. Um. It can be longer for some of the viruses. And in, in the HKU1, there are only two reinfections, I guess, right? Um, mm-hmm. But um, it's so the bottom line here is the antibodies are waning and you get reinfected, but these people don't get sick. So immunity, they're getting infected. So we're not talking about immunity to infection, we're talking about immunity to disease, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. An important distinction to make in the current climate. And also, once again, for uh, the newbies, uh, I think this is a... Humans, and other species as well, but we'll talk about humans, are having uh, basically an equilibrium experience with lots of different viruses, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, And those equilibrium experiences take different forms, okay? In herpes viruses, we may have latency. Uh, In other cases, there may be persistent infections and et cetera. But, you know, uh, over the long haul, we learn how to live with these things, okay? And we don't necessarily experience any disease. And it's not until you look closely that you figure out that, oh, yeah, Yeah, we're getting infected (laughs) with these things. Or, They've established a latent infection, and they're there all the time. So this is not all that unusual, okay? It's a closer look at a virus that's been around uh, for a while, and it's an interesting twist on this equilibrium situation, this uh, consistent uh, reinfection. Uh, But this is, you know, uh, not unusual. There's lots of viruses that we live with all the time. for sure. So a a little bit more detail. They say reinfections were... Uh, occurred as early as six months and nine months, frequently observed at 12 months. For those reinfections at six months, there, we, there was no reduction in antibodies between infections. So that's interesting. So even though there's no reduction in antibody level, they're still getting infected. But again, no disease. 
uh, reinfection intervals of more than six months did so intermediate reductions between of antibodies in between. So they conclude the earliest time point for reinfection is six months. So, you know, even in some cases where these individuals had the same level of antibodies, it didn't go down, they still got reinfected. <laughs> so that's interesting. But they don't get sick, and that's the key here that we may, and if any of this is extrapolatable to, uh, is that a word, extrapolatable? It is now. It is. To SARS-CoV-2, that would suggest that we're not going to have immunity to infection. We, we may have immunity to disease, either conferred by natural infection or by the vaccine. Right. One caveat that they um, mention here is that in these types of studies, they were not able to look at um, whether there was genetic variation in the virus that could have influenced reinfection. So maybe at six months, you were infected with a slightly different yeah. um, strain of the virus genetically or different isolate of the virus genetically. Yeah. Um, and so they, they do point out that they were not able to look at that in this type of study. Um, and so that's one variable that's not sort of okay. uh, controlled for here. So they mentioned the some, go ahead. I was gonna say the other thing they mentioned early on is that for these four seasonal coronaviruses, they belong to two distinct genera and use different receptors mm -hmm. with right. varying host cell tropism. And so they consider that to be pretty broadly uh, variable. And so they say, we hypothesize that the characteristics shared by these four seasonal coronaviruses, such as the duration of protective immunity, are representative of all human coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2. So yeah. they're kind of extrapolating uh, to that or making that assumption or hypothesis yeah. um, that this, these, I didn't really appreciate that before that the seasonal coronaviruses really are in two different right. genera and, and not all that much like each other. Yeah. But if they, if you're finding a property that's similar among them, then maybe that extends to yeah. yep. SARS-CoV-2. That's a good point. So in fact, yeah, I can tell you because yesterday I lectured medical students about coronaviruses. So 229E and NL63 are members of the alpha coronavirus genus and OC43, HKU1, SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2 are all beta coronaviruses. So yes, these are two different genera, two different genera. They do mention that volunteer infections have been done with these viruses. So 229E, because the infections are mild, you can do that. It's ethical to do it, or it's not ethical to do it with SARS-CoV-2 because it can kill you. And it is not ethical to infect people with a virus that can kill you, at least in the US. So there, there have been two reinfection studies with 229E, and this is, addresses this um, genetic var strain variation, uh, they call it strain variation, but you know, isolate variation. Um, Oh, in one study, reinfection of six of nine volunteers with the same 229E isolate at a 12-month interval could happen. <laughs> okay. In contrast, this, another study showed no reinfection when the same strain of 229E was used, whereas reinfection by heterologous strains was successful. So they keep using strains, which I don't think is correct here, but they're just isolates. Um, and they note that uh, in the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, with only slightly varying circulating viruses... I changed from strains to virus. <laughs> Increased susceptibility to reinfection by divergent strains is most likely not the case because there's very little variation. Okay. Now, a few co concluding remarks. This is very interesting. They say caution should be taken when relying on policies that require long-term immunity, such as vaccination <laughs> or natural infection, to reach herd immunity. Because and now, it's, as you see here, you can get reinfected six months to a year. With SARS-CoV-2, we have talked about how antibody levels decline within a couple of months. I think last time we talked about a paper showing serum levels are, are declining. Um, and, and and then they say, but you know, there are there are T cells also, which are important for immunity, uh, and so we have to consider that as well. But they do conclude that reinfections by natural infections occur for all four seasonal coronas, and they suggest it's a common feature for all human coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2. 
So yes, it brings up the, as as Rich said last time. What is herd immunity then? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need to we need to uh, we need to have a very uh, on, immunity can you you have to say immunity to what? Yeah. Anytime you talk about immunity, you have to, to specify. You have to talk about infection you or qualify or disease. In this case, um, you know. At six months, some of these individuals were reinfected without antibody levels going down. So there's no immunity to reinfection, but there is immunity in all cases to disease. And even when antibodies levels go way down, they get infected and still don't get sick. So there must be something else preventing them from getting sick, I suppose. Uh, maybe T cells, as they suggest. But yes, whenever you say immunity, and I think we've been doing this recently, you have to say, you're talking about infection or disease or both, right? Mm -hmm. It's important to know. But I think this kind of study suggests to us that SARS-CoV-2 is going to be around forever. It's going to be circulating forever. Hopefully, it will not cause serious disease most of the time once, uh, you know, natural infection or, or vaccines have provided some kind of immunity. But I don't think yeah. it's going anywhere, right? One of my, I just remembered this morning, one of my friends had written to me because he read something by, I think it was by Eddie Holmes, and who talked about how this virus may become endemic. And my friend was disappointed that it would become endemic. And it's like, well, dude, we've only eliminated one human virus in the past. <laughs> They're all still with us. So, well, you know, I, I remember still from the first Barrick episode, he said, this will probably become the fifth common cold coronavirus. And that just makes yep. perfect sense to me. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, we don't, we don't, actually know that but this this no, is no, addressing the the question of uh is there really a difference in the uh intrinsic pathogenicity that is the ability to cause disease between SARS-CoV-2 and these other human uh 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 coronaviruses and we don't know the answer to that only time will tell but one perfectly reasonable hypothesis based on everything we know, is that there may there may be no difference in the intrinsic pathogenicity. And SARS-CoV-2 may be on its way to endemicity. Because of immune deliver. responses, right? Because of the, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I think, as Ralph said, <clears throat> these common cold coronas, you know, spilled over from animal reservoirs hundreds of years ago. And maybe at that time, they were, they were pathogenic, and especially in older people, as is SARS-CoV-2 now, we just don't know. And uh, we have no samples from then, and we can't get any. We can't dig them up or anything. Everything we do know about this virus uh, suggests that it could ultimately behave yeah. like yeah. Uh, one of the endemic human coronaviruses. And frankly, I've been uh, that's been my favorite model of the whole thing ever since we first talked to Ralph. And, and like you said, it doesn't have to involve any change in the virus. It could just yeah. be the population becomes has some kind of immunity, antibody, T cell, or both, and and that prevents the disease in the older people. I mean, that's the key. You know, in younger people, the, there's much less disease, and and so your first infection as a child, it's typically not pathogenic, especially even with these common cold coronaviruses. I'd really like to know why children don't get sick, or get much less sick, because yeah. that's also key to the whole thing. There must be I on mean, some so, islands you know, when you're when you're really an old guy, like and your telomeres are short, like me. Okay, then you know, <laughs> yeah, your immunity starts to crash. All right, and so that makes kind of sense. But you know, generally, people who are forty or fifty are 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 you immune senescent by then? I mean, the, I, the beginning, I guess. In? I think it starts on, going downhill at around 30. Yeah, oh kinda, boy. it depends on um, what you're, how you're defining immune senescent, okay. um, which aspect of the immune response um, you're talking about. But remember- I guess once we've uh, raised our kids to the point that they can feed themselves, nature really doesn't give a hoot anymore, right? <laughs> right. On an evolutionary we're, we're scale. Dispensable, Actually, right? nature yeah. doesn't care until they re it, yeah. reproduce. So once they've reproduced, that's it. That's yeah. all you need. All, everything right. else is gravy. But right. Rich, not every virus in a kid is not pathogenic. You know, many virus oh, infections absolutely. hurt kids. So this is different. It's absolutely. always different, right? Yes. Yeah. It's the same. Very interesting stuff. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the you know, the three of the four of us will not be around long enough to see uh, 
maybe <laughs> if this becomes <laughs> this is going to, becomes and that's cold. the thing we don't know how long it took the no. current seasonal coronaviruses to become endemic yeah, I mean, as you right. i know you have said it could take 50 100 years or more who knows yeah i agree I, it would be so interesting to know more about that sort of historically and to know you know if there had been i i I wish there was a way to know more about that. I had just had a thought for something we can't do, but there must be on some island somewhere people who have never been infected with common cold coronaviruses as a Ooh. child or ever. And I wonder if they got infected, whether that would be a severe disease in them, because that's kind of what we're postulating here, right? Uh, the other thing is that I uh, presume, and I think I have read in places, that um, infection with uh, the endemic human coronaviruses uh, can cause serious disease sometimes. Mm -hmm. All right. And I'd be interested to know the circumstances there. I mean, it's hard to imagine that an adult could avoid these things. Well, if they're immunosuppressed and have never made an immune response sure. to it, then they could. Yeah. yeah. Or if you're on an immunosuppressive drug and, you, and you're older. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, finally, the last... Uh, document that we have here many many documents listeners. that's a good word a document that's what it is a document was sent to me by a number of people yesterday and many listeners got at least 20 different emails saying you need to address this and i really find it unfortunate that we have to because it's just going to take time that we could do more productively with something else but we have to do it plus it gives it air which we prefer not to do, but it's getting air already. Yeah. So and and people want to know, because as, as many people say, this looks okay to me. What do you think? I'm not a scientist. You know, it's a 26 page document with lots of words and figures and data supposedly. And it kind of looks authoritative, but as you, Oh, it as, looks very authoritative. As, we got diagrams. We got models of the spike protein. We got nucleic acid sequence. We got mutations. Got the we, whole shebang. We got a reference section. Although when yeah. you go to look at it, about fifty percent of the things or more are just preprints or a website. Or yeah, lots like of that. websites. Yeah. So uh, it is a twenty-six page document which uh, is called Unusual Features of the SARS-CoV-2 Genome Suggesting Sophisticated Laboratory Modification Rather Than Natural Evolution and Delineation of Its Probable Synthetic Root. And the authors are Yan, Kang, Quan, and Hu. And they are from the Rule of Law Society and Rule of Law Foundation, New York, New York, USA. And there's an email there that you could email the authors from. And, you know, my... Just reading the title, I mean, this is not a title of an article that would ever appear uh, in, in a journal. And as you, in the, you know, the abstract and the introduction is just written in a way that just says everything else is nonsense and what we're going to tell you is really what happened. And I want to go through it in a, a little bit of detail, but as we'll say, to, as we'll tell you, the data are not at all conclusive. It's really nothing different from what we talked about months ago and in which has been debunked in, in published articles and so forth. And that's why it's unfortunate that we have to go, th go through this. But a, a kind of an interesting thing where you can just put out a what's apparently a, um, a definitive-looking document. And, and some of these authors are apparently scientists. I think the first author was a former coronavirus person. I don't know what this the society or law foundation is um actually i have some information on that but we can we can come back to that um so all right so people have said to me please give it fair uh consideration so we'll give it a fair consideration all right so basically the idea here is that this virus was engineered in a laboratory and they purport to give evidence for that and i will just say up front there's no evidence for it whatsoever there's more evidence that this came from nature we've talked about this multiple times on twiv there's really good evidence. What they have here are accusations that are not founded in any way. And I will go through, we will go through and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. And let me just, a few, a few ideas from the, from the abstract and the introduction. They say, due to it, despite its tremendous impact, the origin of SARS-CoV-2 has mis remained mysterious and controversial. No, it's not mysterious and controversial. We have wonderful evidence, genomic evidence, that it came from a bat isolate and that is 
a recombinant of many different viruses, and the lineage tracks back decades. We did a paper not too long ago showing that. It's very clear. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a way of using words to kind of start to you know, get in between <clears throat> your, your, your sensibility and say, oh, maybe, maybe they're right. The natural origin theory, although widely accepted, lacks substantial support. I don't know. Every virologist I know is okay with it. I don't know who right. you're talking That's, about here. That, that statement is not true. Right. Uh, the alternative theory that the virus may have come from a lab is censored on peer-reviewed scientific journal. No, it is not censored. It is rejected because all the manuscripts don't have any support for it. Isn't that a horrible That's way to say is. censored? <laughs> that mean, and, it's, and, and to a person who's not familiar with the scientific process, they always say, oh, my God, they're being censored? Really? <laughs> no, it's just okay. peer review. Uh, um, in my typical way, I'm going to be pedantic about the writing. Uh, I wanted to point out earlier that the title would be better with a comma after the word evolution <laughs> because it's two independent clauses. And here, the first sentence about the natural origin theory um, da, da, da. and the alternative theory is censored. They're, they're not even parallel. Yeah. yeah, there are lots of writing issues it's here. It's a problem, but they're trying to get in to get to people who don't know about the science, and and you know use these words, and then people are like, yeah, I guess that could be right, right? Uh, they they say the virus has biological characteristics that are inconsistent with a naturally occurring zoonotic virus, and they go through it, and we'll talk about that. But that's not true. It has very consistent properties, and they they point out two isolates. So two bat coronaviruses that were isolated in 2018, ZC45, ZXC21. They think these were the template or the backbone for making this virus. And I'll tell you why that's totally improbable, unlikely. And then, of course, they say we, we have to investigate. In the end, they say the lab should be investigated for sure because we have to prevent this in the future. So there's some, in my view, because there's very little scientific support for their idea, I think there's some... Dry, there's something else behind this paper that I don't understand. Um, and it, you know, the introduction is also full of this. Um, and and then here's one thing they, that really is uh, annoying. This is a Nature Medicine paper that we talked about a long time ago by a variety of authors, including Rambeau and Eddie Holmes and Ian Lipkin and others. You know, the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2, where they go through all the genomic data and they say this for all these reasons had to come from nature. It couldn't have come. And they say here in the introduction, the central conclusion of this article is now being challenged from scientists all over the world. It's baloney. <laughs> no, it's not being it's challenged. Not true. And then they say the authors of the article have conflicts of interest, raising concerns on the credibility of it. All this is just is a smokescreen, in my opinion, right? But not only that, but that's not science. No. Right. And and I think it was a uh, Newsweek that pointed out that the conflicts of interest are that uh, Ian Lipkin received some award from some Chinese institute. And then the second one is just pointing <laughs> to Eddie Holmes CV. Yes. Yes. So this is true. Yeah. Um, then they say uh, all of the evidence that this is from nature, the virus is, is based on this virus called RATG13. Right, which we have talked about for a long time. It's an isolate from um, 2013 from Yunnan, a cave in Yunnan, which has 96% nucleotide sequence identity with SARS-CoV-2. And they say this this virus is bogus. Actually, later on they say it's just it's a fake it's fake data put out there by scientists to to mislead them. <laughs> okay, <laughs> for which I see no evidence whatsoever. But I tell you, 96% identity is higher than the identity of the two viruses that they can claim are the backbone. Uh, of yeah, and, and I, I think that this is actually a really important piece um, because they say that both RATG13 and the one other virus that seems to cluster closely in the Nature Medicine paper um, are both fake. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so they completely discount them. And that um, is why they're going with these alternatives, ZC45 um, and what is it, ZC21. Um, but the other reason why I think that this is actually a really important point is that um, later on in the text, um, they mention uh, some more of these issues about RITG13. 
And they say that they are in the process of putting together another manuscript on RATG 13 um, and how it is fake and such and such. And that is <laughs> that manuscript is forthcoming. Um, and I point that out because that makes me think that they are going to get another news cycle yeah, um, when their are. second manuscript comes out. Um, and so we should sort of be aware that that is coming um, and that that does not have any support. And so we can sort of preempt preemptively say um, that there is not evidence for that. So the uh, one of the ways I look at this is that the difference between science, one of the differences between science and pseudoscience is that in pseudoscience, you start with the conclusion that you want and then you cherry pick the data mm -hmm. to support that conclusion with a complete unwillingness mm -hmm. to change anything about the conclusion. In real science, you may start with a hypothesis, and then you examine the data in an unbiased, uh, unbiased fashion. And if the data do, don't support your hypothesis, you mm -hmm. modify the hypothesis, and then uh, you know it's a reiterative process. You go through that. Now, in this case, being pseudoscience, okay, they have their conclusion that this thing is fake, and in order for that to work, they have to say that the RATG13 virus is fake. <laughs> because otherwise, their hypothesis doesn't work. As we've yeah. already said, yeah, yeah. there's no evidence for that. But they have to throw out that virus, okay? Uh, otherwise, the whole thing crashes. You know, the, what's, what's amusing is that RATG13 was originally supposedly the backbone <laughs> of SARS-CoV-2 until people pointed out, you know, 4% difference is a lot of bases in a 30,000 base genome, it's not likely. And they're scattered all over. Why would someone change them all to SARS-CoV? It doesn't make any sense. And now they're picking two viruses, which they say are the backbone, uh, these uh, ZC45 and ZXC21. And by the way, RATG13, its provenance is very clear in the literature. You can find the original isolation. Peter Daszak talked about it. His organization was involved. There's, there's just zero evidence that it's fake or manipulated in any way. So I discount that completely. But their viruses, ZC45 and ZXC21, I found the references to them. They were both identified separately in 2018. And it's true that they are from um, institutions with a military affiliation, okay? And they say uh, because they, they were made or isolated in these military universities that they're nefarious, right? So that alone is saying that they have to be the back, but they must have manipulated these. But these are, in fact, bona fide isolates uh, of viruses. But the interesting thing is they have even less nucleotide identity with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Which is, is why you have to throw out our ATG-13. Yeah. So this one of these two is 89% in a genome of 30,000 bases. That's 3,300 nucleotide differences. There's no way that's the backbone. There's no way someone started with that and somehow changed the receptor binding and a few other things and got to SARS-CoV-2. Sorry. The, yeah, I mean, later on, they talk about a um, proposed way that one could have done this. Um, and that sort of talks, sort of implies, well, that's where all these base pair differences come in. But then they have <laughs> other places where they're very strong about how base pair differences didn't happen. Um, and so it's sort of like they... There are four that totally happened, or the four that totally didn't change, but these 3,300, they changed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I should point out that we talked earlier about SARS-CoV-2 is changing about 20 bases a year, right? So how many years would it take to have 3,300 change? A lot of years, mm -hmm. right? 10, 100 years or something. So there's just no way that this is, is a, a valid argument, and it's, you know, I think they're you can't convince any scientists of this, but maybe people who don't understand the material would say, okay, it sounds good. So that's one thing. The second thing is they, they focus on the receptor binding motif, which uh, has a very f high affinity binding to ACE2. It's very different from SARS-CoV. It's a better binder. And of course, the bad viruses don't have high affinity uh, binding site for, for ACE2. And they say, this was made. This has to have been made in a lab because it's such high affinity binding. And I would say, well, that's why it wasn't made in a lab because in models that were made previously, previous to SARS-CoV-2, of the binding of the R 
RBD2, ACE2, based on SARS and other coronaviruses. These amino acid changes would never have been predicted to increase binding. It would be something else, and no one would ever have done this. And as had been pointed out, if you tried to do it in cell culture, it would take you years and years and years to do this. So for the very reason that they're arguing that it had to be made, that's actually why it, it wasn't made in a laboratory, because no one would have known how to do this. Yeah, so they sort of have this argument that um, this receptor binding motif of SARS-CoV-2 doesn't bind as well to bat. Um, and so it could definitely not have come from bat because it binds so poorly to bats. Um, and bat, there would never be a virus in bats that um, has a receptor binding motif that binds poorly to bats. Um, but I think that one thing people should also think about is that this is a part of the virus that um, tends to change um, a fair amount because this is the part where antibodies are um, binding. And so there is actually some selection for variation here. And in fact, it's quite likely that you would get changes in the virus, some that might bind better, some that might bind worse to bats in the bat as the virus is trying to avoid the bat's immune system. I also think that these high affinity changes just arise randomly. And we talked about this with Raul Rabadon. They, they arise randomly because it doesn't matter for the virus in bats if, if you have high affinity ACE2 binding. And then if this virus happens to encounter a human, then it replicates very well, and maybe an additional change is selected. Who knows? But there ha doesn't have to be a selection for this right. high affinity binding site. Uh, you raise another uh, question that I was going to pose, and that is we don't really know when this spillover happened. No, right? we don't. No. Okay, so there's, it's possible, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me possible that, it, in fact, it spilled over decades ago, and some of the... Yeah. Uh, maturation of affinity for the human uh, uh, receptor happened in the human population. It could be, sure. It could be, for sure. We don't know. But that's why we need to do more sampling. And apparently this is not being done very much these days. So that's a problem. And then the final thing, which is a key part of their argument, they say there's this furin cleavage site in the spike. It's a cleavage site for a cell protease, right? It's, they say this is definitely put in by a human because this is not in any bat <laughs> coronavirus, and this is key to reproduction in human cells. Well, that statement is wrong. There's a paper that we discussed a, a while ago in Current Biology describing this isolate RMYNO2, which also has high nucleotide identity with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and I quote from the last sentence of the abstract, critically, and in a manner similar to SARS-CoV-2, RMY NO2 was characterized by the insertion of multiple amino acids at the junction site of the S1 and S2 subunits of spike. This provides strong evidence that such insertion events can occur naturally in animal beta coronaviruses. So their statement that fewer insights are never found is wrong. And that's a key part of their argument. And then finally, one last thing. They say, oh, look, there's a restriction site on either side of the gene for the re receptor binding domain. They could have used that. Yeah, the restriction sites are everywhere. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's and, darn And in it. this day and age, if you really wanted to be doing engineering, you probably wouldn't be doing it with restriction sites. There's That's right. You'd be doing PCR, right? Ways. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Three right. of us might choose to do it that way, but Brienne yeah, would our, jump our on some guys, other yeah. newer <laughs> I, I, I would um, use a Gibson assembly, which would not leave any restriction <laughs> sites. Um, and I think that there are sort of a couple things to say. One, if having restriction sites in a genome mean that something is engineered, then E. coli is engineered. Um, <laughs> oh, no. Are you our, are you accusing that, Debris? As are most uh, microbes and most organisms. Um, but the restriction site thing, I think, is, is a really uh, important part of the cherry picking. Because earlier they say, oh, well, those 3,300 mutations in the backbone just happened during passage. No. But somehow the restriction <laughs> sites absolutely didn't mutate. And there are also two codons that they say are, are um, unusual codons um, somewhere else. And those managed to not mutate, but 3,300 other random things yeah. totally yeah, did. Yeah, this is not. And, you know, the thing that's it's unfortunate is that apparently this first author has some virological experience. And so for her to say these things, I, it's either intention or 
ignorance. I don't know which one. It's very sad because you hard know, to know what the motivation is, except that you get airtime. I don't right? know what the motivation is here. But anyway, so the, basically, all these arguments were made before. They're not correct. Uh, there's nothing new here, um, and I think you should take it as an, another uh, attempt at getting attention. And, and I'm not sure what the motive is, but it's not correct. This virus came from nature. It didn't come from any laboratory. You know, I have a little bit of, I consulted a friend of mine mm -hmm. uh, who might have some, I thought might have some insight into uh, both the organization, the affiliation that these people talk about and the individual uh, herself. Uh, and if I could just mm -hmm. spend a moment on that, he says he doesn't know anything about the foundation. It appears to be one of the organizations founded by Miles Gao, Wang Gui Gao, a shady Chinese businessman. And he gives a Wikipedia link to it that's actually quite interesting. I read that. Uh, Gao's uh, photo is prominently displayed on the website. Uh, Gao is a crook and had become a billionaire real estate developer in China through shady business practices, including using bribes and taking advantages of a close connection to the Chinese intelligence agencies. Uh, after Xi came to power and uh, the Chinese officials who were close to Gao lost out in the power reshuffle, the Chinese authorities started to investigate the business dealings uh, by Miles Gao. He narrowly escaped China and then turned into an activist, first against some Chinese officials and then the entire Chinese government. He has a YouTube channel and his videos are full of rumors and lies about his enemies, <laughs> which are now mainly uh, the Chinese government. Uh, before Steve Bannon was uh, indicted, Bannon stayed in a yacht owned by Gao and appeared frequently in Gao's YouTube videos. I don't believe anything from Gao or any organizations associated with him. Uh, and in fact, he's later, uh, this friend of mine later sent a link to one of these videos with uh, the author, um, uh, um, uh, talking on one of these hmm sort of on one of these YouTube channels talking in a sort of a what appears to be a news format. And this is the ultimate in fake news, uh, talking about uh, how high chlor hydroxychloroquine is actually a miracle drug. <laughs> um, and Bannon's on the same uh, 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 YouTube uh, video. So, so tell us who Bannon Steve, is, did Rich Condit. Uh, Steve Bannon was a, uh, what, a... Uh, political advisor to the Trump campaign and ultimately uh, hired by Trump after he was elected as a um, stra strategic advisor mm -hmm. for the first eight months until he uh, fell out of favor. And Ban has done all sorts of things. Actually, he has a military career uh, early on. Uh, ultimately, he's, he's had some business in the financial sector. Uh, he's ultimately got a Harvard uh, MBA, but uh, ultimately landed him, uh, created a sort of alt-right, uh, quote, news, unquote, service called Breitbart, Breitbart News, okay, which is basically, an, uh, an, as I said, an alt-right, uh, shall we say, information or disinformation outlet. Uh, so... Would that be truthiness? <laughs> Who knows what motivates <laughs> these guys? But Gao, it seems to me, from what everything I can tell, is uh, basically a crook who got caught by the Chinese and now sees on a vendetta mm -hmm. against the Chinese. I see. Okay. With respect to the author, she was educated in mainland China, both an MD and PhD, and had been a postdoc in a very reputable coronavirus lab in Hong Kong until a few months ago. She started to, quote, reveal, unquote, supposed true nature of SARS-CoV online and caught the attention of a U.S.-based blogger with a close connection to Gao. Mm. At the urging of the blogger, she moved to the U.S. Uh, to expose the supposed cover-ups by the Chinese government and her Hong Kong employer. She came to the U.S. without her husband of six years who works the same Hong Kong land with her but does not hold the same views of her. She's since appeared on Fox News and some YouTube channels backed by Gao. Um, uh, this, uh, my friend says, you didn't pay too much attention to what she says because she really didn't have any firsthand knowledge about uh, COVID-19. So this is uh, just crazy stuff to the max. 
So uh, uh, listener Tim had sent in similar stuff, and he said this paper was originally posted on Zenodo, a website which is basically a publicly available repository of science and academic research to which anyone can upload their work. Both of the nonprofits behind the study were formed with, Gao, with Guo, with whom Bannon has collaborated on a number of advocacy efforts targeting the Chinese government and business endeavors that have drawn the scrutiny of federal law enforcement officials. So uh, the Rule of Law Foundation is a 501c3, which is a type of nonprofit. And then there's the Rule of Law Society, 501c4. Hmm. And uh, Steve Bannon serves as the chairman of the 501c4. Beginning to suss what's going on here. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, the, uh, the website of the organization says – uh, their vision is to permit the people of China to live under a national system based on the rule of law, independent of the political system of the People's Republic of China, and that its mission is to expose corruption, obstruction, illegality, brutality, false imprisonment, excessive sentencing, harassment, and inhumanity pervasive in the political, legal, business, and financial systems of China. So nothing to do with science, infectious disease, et cetera, just... Yeah. This is strictly radical politics. Yeah. Should we say keep your politics out of our science? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, this is nonsense, folks. And I'm the authors, I'm, I think that you're doing a disservice to the world. The only thing I can imagine is that you were paid for this in some way. Uh, but I'm sorry because um, this is not how science works. And you should be ashamed right. of yourselves, at, at, in fact. And, and if people want to hear anything else about the science, um, if they look at the details on the in vivo fitness parts of this, they are just wild. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, that was another comment that I was going to make about this because, you know, they go through all of this complicated stuff about how you would engineer this virus. And then uh, they talk about uh, various passaging experiments in animals and other things to make it fit for transmission and have appropriate pathogenesis, <laughs> uh, pathogenesis characteristics in humans. And it's total nonsense, complete nonsense. And this to me is actually, it's an important thing about the whole, uh, the, the pandemic in general. We don't know what makes this virus transmissible in humans, really as transmissible as it is, we don't know what controls the pathogenesis. And so if you wanted to create something that had the characteristics of this in humans, you wouldn't know how to do it. And passaging it in animals is not going to do it, okay? That's going to give you fitness in that animal, but probably not, nece not necessarily, and probably not, fitness in humans. So that's all nonsense. Yeah, it's just yeah. replete. Nonsense and, is an understatement uh, for this section. You know, we've already put more time into this than we should, but I do not think anyone should think about this I, for another moment. You can refer people back to this part of the episode. Yeah. Maybe I'll cut this out and release it on its own, just <laughs> not from a lab, just so that people can, because people say, ah, oh, two hours, I can't listen to two hours. Okay, thank you everyone for, for uh, reading and thinking about that, I appreciate it. Uh, let's do some it email. It gives my adrenals a workout. It does. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Kathy, can you take uh, that first one? Mary writes, dear TWIV team, thank you so much for all you do. I wouldn't be making it through this without you. I haven't missed a podcast since my dear friend Neva from Buda turned me on to Rich Condit and TWIV back in March. This week, TWIV 660, during the letters, I heard a criticism of Dr. Christian Drosten's dismissal of the value of rapid saliva testing. Because I'm a regular fo follower of the podcast, I too caught that and was at first surprised. So I replayed it a couple of times. What I gathered after replaying is that Drosten's very sincere observation, apparently contradicting Michael Minna's input from TWIV 640, appears to be made from the perspective of someone who is not an epidemiologist or focused on public health policy. As Drosten said, he's a clinical virologist. Diagnostics is his métier. And a diagnostician would wish for the very most accurate test, but that's not what Michael Minna was after. It's been frustrating to me for a long time to hear this type of apparent conflation and disagreement articulated here by Vincent in his support for the criticism of Dr. Drosten on this point. 
I think the conflation needs to be dispelled, and I have an idea I've been thinking about. It appears to me that there are two reasons for testing. The distinction between the two is huge, in my opinion. One, diagnosis for the purpose of treatment of an individual. Two, indication of infection or potential transmissibility in individuals for the purpose of public policy. But people don't know that there are these two distinct purposes. I'm betting that the first purpose is hugely important in every single person's mind on account of the scariness of this novel coronavirus. It sort of obliterates everything else. Am I infected? Will I get horribly sick and possibly die? Who doesn't want to know the answer to this question to the highest degree of accuracy? And I only want to know it once. But this highly accurate answer is completely irrelevant to a school superintendent who has to decide how his school district is going to operate this year or to a corporate manager who has to decide how his company is going to operate or to a governor who has to decide what closures to set or lift. The second purpose is vastly more important to our society and to the world, but it is so hard for people to wrap their minds around when they are naturally obsessed with the first. I think the TWIF can serve a valuable public service in the weeks and months ahead if you guys can clearly clarify the different purposes of testing. Vincent was right to join in the criticism of Drosten's dismissive reaction to rapid versus accurate testing, but the criticism assumes that Drosten knew which question he was answering. I don't think he did. Warm regards, Mary. P.S. My years working for a federal agency lead me to squirm at the criticisms of the federal agencies charged with administration of the response to COVID-19. There is no them. There are hundreds or even thousands of individual public employees who have the best interests of the public they serve at heart for the most part. Some public appointees who may not share that ethic have more power at certain agencies than they do at others. So I, I think the point that she makes about um, uh, what the question was and, and Drosten's mindset is it, it's well taken that he's thinking of it from a, a pathology diagnostician point of view and that from that standpoint um, at the at that time uh, maybe saliva still wasn't seen to be as uh, indicative but um, for and and for the situation in Germany where they don't have such a large uh, population of infected people as we do in the United States, they're looking for testing for different reasons. And we are trying to figure out, you know, we want to look at asymptomatic people and saliva is going to give us a way to easily sample people and get to that answer. So I, I think. I don't, I don't I like know. Uh, I don't know what, what he was thinking. It's hard to guess, right? I would, sure. even though he says he's a, you know, clinical virologist, I think he's got a broader view of the whole problem than most, but I, I just don't know. This could be a reason. The idea, that of, of, though, of two different kinds of tests is absolutely spot on. There's diagnostic and there's screening tests, which is what Michael yeah. Min is talking about. I, yeah. I, have mm -hmm. we, we, I think we've said that. Yes, yeah, we've, we've, sure. we've mentioned that. that. But I know yeah. that in other conversations I've had with outside of TWIV, um, that, that's an important distinction that being emphasized that there this is a screening test it's not to figure out if you're sick or not yeah but there are still a lot of people yeah. who aren't getting it oh I mean, yeah there was a big new york times article yes. about it totally just, they don't get the difference no and, totally uh, and i heard I a federal Mary, I think we can try and our listeners can try to explain the difference if you want to use the smoke detector analogy or whatever there's there's uh, a um that. So there's a, a, a czar of testing in the administration, right? I, I, forgot, uh, his, I forgot his name. Uh, yeah. Anyway, he said the other day, this idea of everyone taking a, a rapid test is pie in the sky. I mean, that just shows you don't get it. It's not pie right. in the sky. Uh, by the way, the, the criticism of the agencies, you know, we have criticized CDC and so forth. But I think we always say we know people who work there and they're very good and it's just the you know, the, the top level people that are having the issue. So I totally am with that. I mean, I know a lot of people at CDC, they're good scientists. I'm not talking about them for sure. I am talking about the directors who, right. you know, and, and those scientists, you know, 
they're going to be as frustrated as we are at the kinds of things that are happening with the leadership in the same way that the mm. rank and file state department employees are probably frustrated with, with those kinds of things. And these individual employees really don't have the opportunity to make much of a stand by resigning their positions because they need their positions one and two, yeah. <laughs> there's sure. some rank and file member whose resignation is not going to have much of an effect. So yeah. Right. Yeah. While them doing their job well um, could be useful. Yep, exactly. I keep going back to the conversation we had with, uh, was it Denise Esposito? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, who made the clear distinction that uh, the heads of these agencies are political appointees. I mean, they, they have science back, appropriate, well. Sometimes. Uh, in an ideal world, they have appropriate scientific background, okay? Um, but they're political appointees, whereas the rest of the agencies are... Uh, which I've come to uh, ironically call the deep state, are the <laughs> are the real uh, scientists. And I personally still have a fundamental trust in these agencies, the CDC and the FDA. I'm not willing to throw them throw that baby out with the bathwater when it turns out that some one of the political appointees does says or states something uh, just foolish. Okay, under pressure from the government. And I'm also um, gratified to see that when something like that does happen, there's uh, a huge ad hoc pushback from the scientific community that often results in these people walking back one statement or the other. So, uh, you know, there is there are efforts, it seems to me, being made to corrupt these agencies, but so far they haven't succeeded uh, in the long run. So uh, trust but verify. Okay, we have to be wary. We have to understand what's going on. We have to do whatever it takes to <clears throat> get rid of this political pressure and return these agencies to what they're intended to be. Okay, uh, but in the meantime, I don't think the whole situation is corrupt at this point. I still fundamentally trust them. We just have to keep an eye on it, understand what's going on. On a personal note, uh, Mary had started writing to me sometime back in maybe June or <laughs> I know on July 4th. And uh, it's a fun correspondence. And then she happened to mention in this letter uh, that she was turned on to TWIV because of Neva in Buda. And we met, I met Neva at TWIV 500 and Rich met her long before that, before he even moved to Austin. And well, so, we all met her as yeah. a correspondent early on in yeah. the earliest days of TWIV. And when yeah. you moved to Austin, then you sought her out, right? Well, actually, even before that, because remember, oh, yeah. if you if you if you Google TWIV Buda, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's Buda's actually in a in a show title. Right. Neva kept writing us TWIV for uh, Neva from Buda, which yeah. is spelled B-U-D-A, yeah. and one is prone to pronounce that as Buddha. But I knew, because Buddha is right next to where my daughter lives, and we visited there, ah, that it was Buddha. Got it. And there was a whole conversation about it. <laughs> okay. It was the Buddha arc. Yep. Okay, how you pronounce Buddha. And there was so much of this that one time when we visited uh, Sarah in Austin long before we moved, I decided to engage Neva and go out to lunch. And we did that. And then that was before I even knew we were going to move. Now we moved here and Neva's, you know, a good buddy. But Mary's not in. Uh, Mary's it, on the West Coast. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. She and yeah. Neva went to what? High school together, Kathy? Yes. Yes. Got it. So in searching yeah. for this email, Kathy, to put in, I mm -hmm. found that she's written uh, five or six other emails uh, <laughs> as well, which we didn't get to. <laughs> and, you know, I'm always amazed at the email. They're really great. For the most mm -hmm. part, they have. Really, I'm amazed at how well most people are writing, you know, mm -hmm. they write, they're very nicely written and they ask good questions. So I really appreciate that. We'll get to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Jamie writes, hi, TWIV crew. I got sick in March before much was known about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID. Well, other than a certain someone who had by then been told that this thing was deadlier than the flu, but didn't want to panic anyone. <laughs> See what I did, Vincent? Didn't get political at all. <laughs> I knew that I was sick and I looked for information. Found you guys and you became my new friends. 
I laughed at your banter and absorbed the info like a sponge. It tied me to the world that I couldn't experience for um, 91 days. So some poetry, a haiku. Couldn't leave the bed. I coughed alone and scared. Twiv was my lifeline. Very good. And a freeform poem. Masks are cool. Just wear one. Don't be a fool. Before you speak of your rights, just remember those who lost their fights. Those who wake up drenched in sweat from days of torture they can't forget. They found forms to write their wills in case they succumbed to their ills, cried out for someone to be there when they walked too far and gasped for air. For those who qualify for financial benefits if infected, but false negative tests left them rejected. For long hauler patients who long ago ran out of patients, whose doctors denied that something was wrong and they tired of hearing that same song. Please wear the mask. It's not just for me that I ask. It's for others not yet left with lasting ick from a virus, the kind that makes you sick. Mm. That's outstanding. Lovely. Very good. I like that. Very good. And so Jolene, who does the timestamps, has volunteered to go through the email and post the verse that I forget to do <laughs> from time to time, <laughs> oh, cool. which is great. And I and, and Thanks, Jolene. I just... I don't know why I searched haiku in all the G- in all the emails, thousands and thousands of emails, and there are a whole bunch that I still <laughs> haven't read. So we got a lot more poetry, <laughs> just haiku, and so this is great. It's going to be a wonderful microbe.tv slash twivverse. Very cool stuff. Um, Rich, can you take the next one? Anonymous writes, dear podcasters. In today's episode number six six one with Ralph Barrick, and in the recent episode with Christian Drosten. You asked them what went wrong in the U.S. Rich also asked Professor Barrick about a, quote, middle way, unquote, that would allow the U.S. to manage the pandemic without the economy going completely belly up. That's when I thought I would provide you with a different view on that matter and in the process relay my impression on another thing that went right in Germany, adding to the factors Professor Drosten mentioned, Merkel early testing. In May 2020, Easter holidays and Labor Days were over in Germany. The mild lockdown was gradually lifted, and the anticipated spike in uh, case numbers failed to appear. This left everyone discussing how that could be, and how to proceed, and which value of the reproduction number to aim for. Most assumed that it would have to be a trade-off between the economy and public health, aiming for RT of less than one would uh, benefit uh, health, public health, and be the prudent thing to do epidemiologically, but be detrimental to the economy. Many expected conflicts between social and employer-friendly parties and organizations. The idea of reaching herd immunity was already shot down at that point by two statements of the National Academy of Sciences uh, National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, the director of the Koch Institute, uh, Lothar Weiler, and with the help of Christian Drosten and other science communications like uh, Mai Tai Nian Kim in April, gives uh, footnotes and references to these. In this situation, on May 13th, 2020, the IFO Institute, an independent economics institute associated with the University of Munich, and the Hamholtz Center for Infectology came up with a co-joint study, and he's got a reference to that, that was widely spread in the news outlets after Christian Drosten devoted an episode of his podcast to it. Unfortunately, it is only available in German, but its main message can be easily explained using graph number three on page five. It shows modeled statistical projections of the monthly economic performance of Germany on the y-axis in relation to time on the x-axis axis, and five assumptions of the re, uh, reproduction number RT, uh, and he specifies those. One, counterfactual, <laughs> the, uh, the evidence doesn't exist. I'd probably use a different label for that. RT is 1.0, RT at 1.0, RT at 0.5, RT at 0.5, RT at 0.1. By the way, these are hypothetical reproduction numbers, okay? where one is that uh, a person infects one other individuals, and all these others are reducing a reproduction number to something less than that. 
The graphs show that it would be ideal for the economy to aim for an RT of 0.75, as that would allow the economy and society to gradually recover while keeping the initial recession relatively flat. What media and science communicators made of this was uh, made of this was the message: fight Corona or strengthen the economy. Both, and RT 0.75 is the ideal value. So this is the bottom line. This is the idea of a middle way. I believe that from this point on, the whole society assumed this would be the new goal after flatten the curve acted accordingly and greatly benefited from doing so. Many people started to gaze at the numbers like deer stare at headlights, and what came of that is a different story. While this study was tailored to Germany, and of course there were many assumptions and caveats, it generally proved to be very useful to be thinking about the management of the pandemic, not as public health versus the economy, but instead to realize that both would benefit from doing the right thing. Although now I believe it probably is other people than you who do not get this. <laughs> Thanks anyway for listening to my storytelling from across the pond. And please keep up your work that I really enjoy watching or listening to. Best wishes at 414.38 ppm from Freiburg, Germany, where there are 127 micrograms per cubic meter of CO2 in the air right now. <laughs> this is Armin. I'll, P.S. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Professor Racaniello for making his virology course publicly available. I'm currently at lecture number eight, but now it takes me more than eight hours uh, to work through each lecture, and I fear I soon won't be having enough time to follow it further. Keeping up with all the new vocabulary is a real challenge. But I expect to be—I uh, expect to become more fun at parties the longer I keep <laughs> yeah. it up. UPS. I hope you all know about uh, a website called Deeple.com, which is a machine translation website uh, whose results are far superior to translate at Google in many cases. And then he gives references to his article. So this is interesting. This is a—I uh, looked at this paper at one point, and you can, if you look at. Uh, the figure number three, uh, despite the German, more or less figure out what's going on. And it's a, it's a model that finds the middle way between, uh, you know, public health measures and the economy and says we can, we can do both. I think in a haphazard fashion, uh, we're finding that middle way mm. uh, in other cultures. I also think that a lot of this depends on what, at the time you decide to, uh, initiate appropriate practices, what the virus load is, okay? If you start in a situation where your test positivity rate is 10%, you're not going to be able to accomplish this in the same fashion. I think your starting point is important. I don't know how you target 1.75.5 and 0.1. It's and a model. I right? don't – and – how do you say, okay, we're going to go for 0.75, whereas anything under one would be fine, right? Because yeah. that's enough to stop it. Because then it dies. And yeah. then I, I just remember what Christian said. He said, Germany is <clears throat> not one country, but many, and it's hard to get everyone to do the same thing. So yeah. how did this work? I don't know. Anyway, there are a lot of good resources here. Um, I appreciate it. I just want to say to Armin that uh, if he keeps listening to your lectures, he's going to get to lectures that are about uh, evolution and things that we have talked about recently on TWIV. Yeah. So I think he'll find it a little bit easier. Yeah, the first 12 are hard. Yes. The microbiology is hard, but then you get into you know pathogenesis. It's a little easier going, and it may, you may find it more relevant. I would keep going if you can um, because it's uh, Vincent, really— the people who take your course— uh, is some sort of molecular biology or biochemistry a prerequisite? Yeah, I well, they're supposed to. Yeah, they're supposed to have an advanced biology course. Uh, we have several at Columbia, but um, some don't. You know, there's no way to it. prevent registration if you don't have the prereq. Right. <laughs> so, right. and many well, students plus will, you don't want to discourage it. People can. I don't want to discourage it. And people always ask Sometimes. me, you know, I haven't taken this. And I said, well, go look at last year's 
look at a lecture from last year and see if it makes sense to you. And if you don't know the difference between translation and transcription, then you're going to have a problem. So, yeah, I mean, uh, RNA, DNA, protein, genetic code, transcription, translation. There's a lot of concepts and a lot of vocabulary. That's a lot, sure. In the long run, it's not all that difficult, I don't think. But if you're starting from zero, it's a struggle. Yeah, for our students, we we do what I call front end loading the exams. <laughs> we have the exams at the beginning of the course really often because there's so much new material. And then as the course progresses, you know, you might have six or seven lectures covered on an exam where the first exam we cover just four lectures. For it's just hard new stuff for a lot of them. And even if they have had biochemistry or molecular biology, it's amazing how much they don't know about translation and yeah, DNA replication. Yeah. Also, I mean, it's scary. They forget also very easily. That having been said, uh, I want to reemphasize, it's not impossible. No, not okay? at all. No, not and at all. in the long run, conceptually, actually, it's quite straightforward. Okay. We are not special people. Okay. <laughs> Anybody can do this. All right. Yeah. yeah it's, sure. it's not that you need to um, have some special understanding of transcription and translation, you just need to have thought about them slightly differently than you might have in an earlier course. Um, and so sometimes it just takes a little thinking um, to get that new um, mode of sort of into your mind. You don't even really have to know any chemistry, right? It's, it's tinker toys. Eh, a little bit, yeah. not right? too much. No, you don't have to know, know hardcore chemistry about how bonds form and all of that SN1 and SN2. No, but like anything else, you know, the more you use it and think about it, the more you're going to remember. So we are special in the sense that we think about viruses every day. And so we remember stuff. And, um, and, and me personally, I teach the same course every year. So I remember stuff that a lot of other people don't remember. And if you hear a lecture once and then forget about it for a year, you're not going to remember anything from it. So Facility comes from familiarity and, and yeah. thinking about things. So it's hard. I know I've been if it's not your about job. DNA and the genetic code for fifty years. Yeah, and um, so you get the terms stay there. And I know in other aspects of the world, you know, if I hear a term, and I say, "Oh, I, that's what that means." There was something recently I, I looked up. I'm going to forget about this in a week because I'm not going to think about it anymore. I'm going to totally forget about it. So I've taken to writing things down that I want to remember, and then I forget yeah. where I wrote them. <laughs> I, I like um, using the dictionary apps on my phone because when I go and look up the next word, the previous word that I looked up is still there. Ah, cool. That's and good. And oftentimes I look at it and say, I, I don't remember what that was. And so I try and learn it again. Yeah. But I wanted to point out Armin's footnote. Uh, there's this Germany's daily most watched TV show by Dr. Nguyen, in which Dr. Nguyen Kim had a comment. And he said, you can let it be automatically translated. It's not perfect, but you'll get the message. Mr. Immunity means herd immunity. German word, <laughs> herd and immunotot gets misinterpreted. That's so funny, yeah. isn't it? I love that. that. Yeah, I love herd, herd, and, herd yeah. and immunotot is a great word. <laughs> well, because, it would, because it would be pronounced hair, hair and immunity. Oh, immunity. yes, hair, right. Oh. So, so that's Mr. Immunity. <laughs> yes, that's cool. Okay. Uh, Justin writes, emails offer a look into whistleblower charges of cronyism behind potential COVID-19 drug and sends a link to a science article by John Cohen and Charles Piller. And uh, this is all about, um, you know, the administration trying to push uh, money towards certain companies to move drugs forward. Uh, so... Here, for example, a, a top officer at a U.S. agency charged with accelerating the development of drugs for COVID-19 got a request uh, to give $300 to help develop a drug that the contracting officer pushed back. And that episode, which had not been reported, is at the heart of just one of many allegations made by Rick Bright, who was removed on 20th April as, he as head of BARDA. And so he was testifying about that and other things that were inappropriate, you know, attempts to push. I, I might have misheard, but I, I heard you say $300, but it's $300 million. Yeah, I mean, $300 million, of course. <laughs> $300 wouldn't be a story, would it? <laughs> I didn't think so. Anyway, check that out. And it's not, you know, we're not surprised. Things always happen, right? 
Um, Kathy, can you take the next one? Do another round. Richard writes, Vincent et al. on the TWIV team. I'm a general surgeon at Houston Methodist Hospital and recently presented a case of a patient who thrombosed her superior mesenteric artery after a norovirus infection diagnosed on GI panel PCR. In my research for the presentation, I came across the CDC website, which showed this graft of norovirus outbreak since 2012. Graph of uh, norovirus outbreaks. Since March 2020, it is much less common to have outbreaks. With less food handlers in restaurants, <laughs> cruising at a standstill, largely absent team sports, social gatherings significantly decreased, and new compulsive hand washing, might we not also expect a decrease in the incidence of seasonal flu rather than the dire predictions of a combined pandemic and the flu season? Love the show. It lengthens the time my dog gets to walk. I am learning and laughing. And uh, Richard's from Houston. So, and then oh, we've got the graph pasted in here showing uh, a significantly lower incidence of norovirus outbreaks starting around the middle of March mm. of 2020 relative to 2018 and 2019. So, yeah, uh, Richard, it's something that we've talked about a couple of times before. Uh, would this change the outlook of seasonal flu? And I think if everybody was wearing masks and was staying home and was physically distancing and so forth, we might think that there would be a decrease mm. in the seasonal flu, but there's a lot of concern that that's not going to be the case. And so there's a real push for everybody to get their flu shots because it'll be, they're working on a diagnostic tests that'll be able to tell between uh, SARS-CoV-2 and influenza. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we'll just have to see. It will be interesting. I think yeah, epidemiologists I think are going to coast on this stuff for years to come. I, I think there's some data of um, a reduced flu season in Australia um, earlier this year. Um, and uh, so if perhaps everyone were to comply, as Kathy said, um, then we might expect that. Um, the question is whether everyone will comply. Yeah, and in, in school openings and so forth, you know, it's kind of heterogeneous across the country. Some places schools are in person, other places not. I think it's going to depend. Be interesting to see, though. I know so far we have expected an outbreak of EV enterovirus 68 uh, associated acute flaccid myelitis. Now they they have been occurring every two years, 2014, 16, and 18, starting in July, August, moving into the fall. And so, and you can go on the CDC website and see the reporting. So far this year, we have not seen an uptick uh, that should be here. We're in September already, and it's not. Now, CDC is apparently six months behind in, in reporting of this, so it could be just the reporting delay, but we'll see. It could be that the kids, because they're not, and this is a kid disease, a childhood paralysis, so... We'll see. It's very interesting. Yes, there will be um, a field day for epidemiologists for sure. There's a uh, uh, in, there's a significant dog arc in the uh, email. There's a <laughs> yes. lot of dogs. <laughs> yeah, dog walking. A lot of dogs that are benefiting from TWIV. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, speaking mm -hmm. of masks. So this morning I'm walking in. I wear my mask on the street because you're supposed to wear masks in public. And I see people, they're wearing them under their chin, and then they oh, get close to you and they crazy. slip them up. No, that doesn't work. Keep it on. The whole point is it's it's going to be potentially contaminated. And if you slip it down under your chin, you touch it, it's no good. What's the problem with leaving it on in public and then carefully removing it when you're inside? Right? And people right. Who wear the mask below their nose, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's too. common sense. But I see someone yeah. this morning, she had it under her chin. And then as I approached her, she pulled it up. And it's like, what? <laughs> and I, I, saw, I saw her and I purposefully looked at her with my, with my glare because I had my mask on. I don't know if you can see a glare under a mask, but it's like, and then she quickly pulled it up. But why are you wearing it below? You shouldn't. That's increasing the self-contamination. So you shouldn't do that. Uh, Brienne. You take the next Pamela one. writes, today in the New York Times, there was an article on the possibility of developing some immunity to COVID-19 by mask wearing. 
because you may get tiny doses of the virus through the mask, but not enough to make you sick. You become asymptomatic and then immune. I think they called it variolation or something like that. Could you discuss this? Thanks, Rich, Pam. Rich, is that the right word for this? No, this drives me crazy. <laughs> uh, just, just, uh, the, uh, it's almost off topic, but you know, it's halfway interesting. Variolation refers to uh, a procedure that was developed. Mm, God, I get, I think you can go all the way back to the 10th century AD. Uh, but uh, actually, it's a pre, pre-vaccination, pre-genarian uh, procedure for uh, essentially immunizing against smallpox. And what it consists of is taking material from the from a pustular lesion from a smallpox vic- a victim and scratching it into someone's skin, and they get a localized. Uh, disease that's really nasty uh, and it immunizes them against it's called variolation because the disease the disease was called variola okay and uh, uh, they get a really nasty local reaction and it has a mm, uh, mortality rate of about one percent but smallpox had a mortality rate of about 30 percent so you're increasing your survivability by about 30 fold okay <laughs> Um, was ultimately replaced by vaccination. But, uh, you know, I think it's almost time to do another smallpox episode and show some really, show people what infectious disease really looks like, okay? Rich, why, like would, they, why would they appropriate? Why would, right? why would they appropriate variolation for this idea? I just don't understand. I, it's just nonsense. I mean, but Brian, the whole idea that Tiny, tiny doses is going to give you immunity. What do you think about that? Uh, I don't really think that that um, <laughs> makes a whole lot of sense. And I don't <laughs> think that we have evidence um, with this virus that a, there's a small dose that leads you to not get sick. Right. Um, I don't think that there there's a, a big um, effect of dose that we've seen thus far in terms of um, what happens in your uh, infection and what kind of disease you might get. But to get... Immunity, the virus needs to re- reproduce in you, right? And exactly. interact with the immune system. So this idea that a tiny amount is its just ridiculous. And it just had come up before. But if it's in the Times, well, I think I saw this. But this is- Yeah. Um, and I checked into a couple of the links. And one of them, um, actually, the, uh, the thing that I saw wasn't first in the New York Times. It was somewhere else. And it had a couple of links. And... One of them referred to a study about influenza that suggested that with influenza, with a lower dose, you might, now I can't remember what it was, if if you get, it's not that the disease is different, but that you would be less likely to get, yeah. And I sent it to Rich, but uh, yeah, Rich. I'm trying to I'm trying to remember what that was. It was uh, uh, people showing up. Actually, uh, this was sort of misinterpreted. I think it was people showing up at the hospital with mild symptoms uh, were cooking up less virus or something like that, and that was equated to if you get a lower dose, you get milder symptoms. But that's not an appropriate extrapolation of that observation. Right, and I, I think that we have not seen the same thing with SARS-CoV-2. So if I remember correctly, when we look at asymptomatic people, um, they have similar amounts of virus um, to uh, people with disease. And so even if that was an extrapolation you could make, which it is not, um, the same data is not present for SARS-CoV-2. Right. Uh, Go ahead. ahead. (laughs) I remember now also that there was uh, a reference to a a paper with SARS-CoV-2 and ferrets, and it was a very small sample size, and it was suggestive that the dose might play a role. Well, I I mean, I can can imagine that the dose will determine whether you're infected or not, and maybe that's really what they were measuring. Yes, yes, that's that's right. And that's when Rich and I uh, had a conversation about infectious dose and uh, dose at 
or a virus load at time of diagnosis right. and those being two right. different things. And, and whether if you're not infected, then will you have be able to get an immune response? Yeah. Um, I think the reason for using variolation as a term in this is that you're talking about uh, hypothetically immunizing somebody by infecting them with exactly the disease agent. Yeah. But as you okay. say, that's not the right word to use for this. No. Because that has no. a very specific meaning, variola virus. Uh, yeah. And by the way, uh, with respect to variolation, my read on that whole thing is that the reason that that worked which is to me fascinating is that uh, ordinarily smallpox is transmitted as a respiratory mm. disease yeah. and yeah. it goes through a systemic phase. And if you inoculate somebody by scratching the uh, virus into their arm, uh, the pathogenesis is different. They, yeah. The people who die, die because it establishes a systemic infection. The ones who survive, the infection is limited to the site of uh, inoculation. So it's a great a demonstration yeah, that the yeah. root, root of inoculation affects the pathogenesis. Yeah, very good. Uh, Rich, take the next one, please. Ken? Ken writes, ah, greetings from Southern Marin County, California. <laughs> Ken, I grew up in Sleepy Hollow, San Anselmo, <laughs> San Rafael. That's my, this is my home stomping ground, depending on how south, far south you are. Greetings from Southern Marin County, California, where the outside temperature is currently 73 degrees F and the air quality is currently 112 EPA PM 2.5, whatever that is, sensor outside my home. And the sky color is currently, what would you call it? <laughs> Apricot? And he has a picture here that it looks like there's, he's standing in front of a volcano or something. <clears throat> oh, who's... Is this Alan? I think that's Alan. Yeah. Inserted this comment. The comment from one of our staff is, "I would call that color napalm in the morning." <laughs> First, I have to say, Twiv is the best. Who knew that a podcast about virology could be so entertaining and somehow reassuring and comforting to listen to? And in addition, informative. It is all the thing, all those things, and more. Thank you. Like a lot of people on the West Coast right now. We're feeling like we got to get out of the place. We are thinking East Coast. <laughs> Question for you, fly or drive? Which is lower risk in your estimation? Assume all normal, to have endorsed, regular person precautions are in, uh, in place and that no camping, uh, somebody's messing with this, no camping will be undertaken. Warmest regards, Ken. Okay. Going across country, fly or drive? <laughs> What a trade-off. Uh, driving, uh, you have more control over your immediate circumstance, but it's going to take you longer, and you got to stop in motels and hotels and presumably restaurants and that kind of stuff. Uh, flying is going to be quicker. I, you know, I, I think that, you know, your exposure is going to be roughly equivalent, maybe even more driving. I think, in my mind, I think about how many people are you going to be exposed to and under what uh, circumstances. Uh, I think I, uh, it's probably, uh, who knows? It's a toss up. Maybe. I mean, either I way, fly. you're going to have to be quarantined when you get here, yeah. right? Two weeks. Yeah. I don't I know. I um, fly. I don't know. I wouldn't go anywhere. Yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> that's true enough. I'm not going. I anywhere. don't think it's worth going anywhere at this point. I'm sorry to say that, but uh, you know, this purple air.com, it, provides a link to its air quality and you look at the u.s man the whole east coast is is green and the west coast is all red wow you guys see that it's really distinctive yeah it's amazing hmm. i've never seen that before yeah things are bad out there i'm sorry um but um yeah i would not fly or drive out here don't come just stay put for a while I'm sorry about that. All right, one more here. Greg writes, hi, Twivers. Weather in Seattle, high of 84, sunny with a hint of wildfire, 77 new cases of COVID-19 per 100,000 over the last two weeks per King County's excellent dashboard. Thank you for your work in building a bridge across the moat, which stands for Miasma of Anti-Think, M-O-A-T, so that we might <laughs> defeat the crowned virus in its capsid castle. <laughs> 
That's really good. Excellent. It's be, poetic. Could be a title, The Crown not Virus. It's more as a prose, but yeah. Immunity certificates. I've been an avid listener of TWIF since March. I was quite taken by Brianne's Brianalysis and Alan's Alambasting of Immunity Passports in 603. I really love that, Greg. I might be stealing that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You might want to put another N in there so it doesn't look like Brian, right? I, I could definitely put another put N another in there. Put another Brianalysis, yeah. Interlude haiku. Rack can yell on, please. Testify twiv your beliefs. The truth, the truth must have teeth. Cool. Very good. Brianne and Alan suggested that the perverse incentive created by immunity passports could cause some folks to intentionally seek infection, if doing so gave them greater access to jobs or social opportunities. But some quite intelligent people stop. I don't care how intelligent people are; they all make mistakes. Okay. So people always say, oh, this person is really smart. They're a doctor. They're a PhD. They can still say stupid things. Okay, that was my interlude. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm quite Turn intelligent. Turn into a haiku, Vincent. I don't know if I've <clears throat> ever written a haiku. It's too subtle for me. But some quite intelligent people have been in favor of some form of immunity passports. If I were Tony Fauci, I'd say, I don't care. Didn't you say yeah. that when he testified? Isn't it peer-reviewed? Yeah. I don't yeah. care. Right. <laughs> <laughs> As expressed in a JAMA viewpoint by Ezekiel Emanuel, bioethicist at UPenn and NIH, it might be reasonable to require immunity certification for employment at elder care facilities or in other limited high-risk situations. Let me just pause here and say, what if immunity doesn't confer immunity to infection and you can still shed yep. and infect these people? So what good is an immunity yep. passport, Ezekiel? Sorry. I promised I wouldn't yell anymore. No, you don't have to apologize for that. That's, uh, <laughs> that's good. That's, yeah. that's good. Uh, that's uh, what? That's the truth with teeth. Well, you know, Ezekiel hasn't thought about this. I, the difference between infection immunity and disease immunity, I'm sure. So right. uh, I can understand that. Of course, the ideal answer is MINIS-style frequent rapid testing. Yes, but if that fails to materialize, it will materialize. And technical issues around correlative immunity and serology testing specificity are resolved. Good luck with that. It seems plausible to me that the immunity passport debate could resurface, particularly if there are significant delays in developing an effective vaccine. But what about this perverse incentive issue? Would people actually intentionally seek out infection? Where, when smart people disagree on theory, we look to data. Professionally, I work with a team of thoughtful and socially minded software engineers to build an intuitive statistical analysis tool. I'm sorry. Intuitive statistical analysis makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an oxymoron. Stats IQ. Our team decided to investigate. We surveyed a representative group of 1,000 Americans on whether they would intentionally seek out infection in order to earn an immunity passport. All right, let's see. 11% of adults, U.S. adults say they would probably or definitely seek infection if that was required to maintain or access employment at an elder care facility. 13% of U.S. adults would do so just to visit elder care facilities. 14% would do so to go to gatherings greater than 25 people. And I guess the rest said no, right, of these 11 I would assume so. Yeah. Those are not all the same people saying yes each time. So in some, more than one in five Americans would seek out infection for one benefit or another. Okay. That willingness to seek infection was concentrated in the young, quite predictably, and for employment-related questions, at least, in the economically insecure, quite depressingly. Yes. And then for that reason, we shouldn't do it because they will seek it disproportionately, right? Right. right. And I would assume that these numbers would change as time goes on yeah. and, mm -hmm. um, you know, people are going longer without all of these things. Political le leanings were not correlated with this willingness, at least after controlling for other factors. It's quite interesting. It, yep, that's interesting. I was open-minded initially, but now quite convinced that immunity passports should not be implemented. Hopefully this research serves as a nail in the coffin of that idea. Nah, never, nothing serves in the nail of coffin of anything, but <laughs> I think it's really interesting that you did that. If anyone's interested in learning more or playing around with the data we collected, just search for Stats IQ Immunity Passport Study. And he gives a link to the results and to the data. Uh, parting thoughts. Most of us can quickly call to mind the face of a nurse or other medical professional we know. 
And for all our society's flaws, the vast majority of us can intuitively appreciate their contributions in this dark time. But to many of us, scientists are often faceless, removed, even abstract. Thank you for putting a face on science, for showing us its humanity. We're all in this together. Greg, and and he has a link to more about him, and then some footnotes. In case any Twivers look at the article, I need to defend our terminology. In the survey, we used the phrase, the COVID-19 virus. And we were worried that some folks would not know the term SARS-CoV-2. We think it's reasonable to call it COVID-19 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, just as one might talk about flu season, the season that causes increase in flu. I mean, I would use the virus that causes COVID-19. I know you want to be short, but what's wrong with that? Well, well, people say the AIDS virus. The AIDS virus. So by analogy. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. This means the virus that causes AIDS. Yep. Uh, Kathy, can you get, I guess you could get infected with the AIDS virus. Yeah. Right. Because you're mm-hmm. saying the virus that causes AIDS. Yeah. But don't say that COVID-19 uh, transmission or something like that. Right. Because then we should yeah. talk about mm-hmm. the virus. All right. Well, listen, Greg, I think the one reason is this: these people who are, you know, economically at, at risk or in hardship would more disproportionately go for self-infection. That alone is enough not to do it. But unfortunately, and I have to tread on on thin ice here, the current climate in this country, people, the majority of people do not seem to care about those individuals. At least from the top down, it is not, they are not shown any compassion. And I think that's horrible. And what's even more horrible is that the current administration was put in place in part by those individuals who thought they would benefit from it. And it's very sad, I think. But I don't want to be political because I don't want politicians messing with our science. And so I should not mess with their politics unless it messes with our science. So you see, we're going around in a circle there. (laughs) And that's a good time to stop this twiv. Yes, Kathy. I, w- I want to go back to the uh, okay. thing yeah, about yeah. the masks and conferring immunity if you get a, yeah. uh, and s- because you might get a low dose. And so that was a commentary that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I haven't read the commentary, but the original article I saw was in the Telegraph. And then that led to one that talked about infectious dose uh, and th- how that might lead to disease or not. And... Um, and so I've pasted those links in, and that's why the text was changing when which was trying to read. But basically, the commentary in the New England Journal of Medicine is just totally speculative. And it's based a little bit on this ferret data and a little bit on this 2010 study of influenza that showed that there was a relationship between infectious dose of the virus and patient outcomes. But that's... We, we don't have any data for that mm-hmm. at this point. Okay. Very good. Twiv664, microbe.tv slash twiv is where you will find links to the letters and the show notes and so forth. If you want to send a question, twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. And look, Kathy has a new camera, a new computer. Look at that. Yes. Doesn't it look great for those of you yes. watching? <laughs> it really is good. And your red sweater is perfect yeah. pop there. Really yeah. nice job. Um, so the, the new the, camera is thanks to people who donated to yep. TWIV because thanks they to don't you. come free. Thanks to you. Uh, we were able to buy Kathy a new camera. And she bought herself a new computer. So thank you, Kathy, for <laughs> wanting to improve Needed the it. sound. and. And there's no more of the weird pinging that we used to get because that apparently was the slow computer. And so, great. And next we will work on, Rich, you're not too bad looking, but we'll get you a, a webcam. I got one for you. Uh, yeah, a webcam isn't going to improve this any. <laughs> <laughs> well, the webcam has a wider field of view, so you'll be back a little. See, Kathy now is a little farther yeah. back, and you will yeah. be too. And uh, But, uh, yeah, you, you don't need improvement, man. You look great. Well, I'm still... Vertical. You look healthy. Yeah, so that's, that's um, good. You look slim. You're, you're looking great. No problem. You, you, still have, you still have telomeres. 
Still have dealing with it. And you have a little bit of bone marrow somewhere. <laughs> Brian Barker is over at uh, Drew University. I'm Bioprof Barker on the Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. What's the big poster behind you? Is that a um, poster? It, it is a poster of a uh, Jackson Pollock painting. Oh, I, lo- I love Jackson Pollock. I do too. One of the few Jackson artists is my favorite. I understand. I get it. I get his I painting. I do too. And none of the, many of the others I don't get, it, but him I get it. What a sad life, unfortunately. But, yeah, but good it was stuff. A great, uh, great uh, uh, biography, a movie about him, and I forget. Uh, I'm even forgetting right now who it started. It was very good. The other, uh, there's one other modern artist I get is that that's David Smith. He does the metal sculptures, the welded metal sculptures, and I mean David Baltimore turned me on to him. He he said once, I, if I could get a David Smith for the Whitehead Institute, David developed the Whitehead Institute initially, he said he would get one, but he couldn't get one. And so I looked it up and it's just these welded sculptures and the surfaces are buffed aluminum or whatever metal and they just have a dimensionality. It's just great, good stuff. Sorry, the it's not this weekend. The, uh, the, go ahead. It's not this weekend sorry. art. I'm very sorry, folks. <laughs> the movie is, it, we, it's this weekend everything. Yeah. Tweet. Tweet. <laughs> uh, the movie is called Pollock, and it starts uh, stars Ed Harris. Yeah, I just remember really seeing a, a movie of the actual Jackson. He's, he's in the garage with a brush flicking stuff over, and then you look at this. He says, "Yeah, I see that. It's that rhythm is there. It's so good. Really like." All right, sorry about. That. I, I know some people hate it when we diverge. I'm so sorry. Not- yeah, but a lot of people love it. It's okay. Rich Condit. Jackson Paul is pretty great, so it's worth it. He is. He this is. is what you get. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently living in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>